Good afternoon. I'm David Kasich from InVivo Magazine, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this latest in our series from the Innovators Workbench, a discussion a series of discussions of medical device innovators. With Michael Lesh today, we come back to a model that we've seen before, the physician entrepreneur. But unlike, say, Julio Palmas, Michael isn't just a hasn't invented just one product. In fact, he's responsible for at least three companies that we'll talk about today. And unlike other physician entrepreneurs, Tom Fogarty, John Simpson, Rodney Perkins, um, Michael's compressed his entrepreneurial activity to a relatively short time frame. In fact, in a lot of respects, Michael may be closest to what we think of when we think of a classically uh, designed physician entrepreneur, a doctor who identifies a clinical problem, sets about to solve it, and in the process creates companies to create the tools to solve those problems. So Michael, thanks for being here and welcome. And let's just begin with some of your early life. I know that you grew up in the Chicago area. Talk a little about that, your early days and some of the formative influences that you had. Sure, yeah, I grew up uh, in the Chicago area, originally the city, and then we moved to the suburbs as uh, so many families did. And uh, I guess I was kind of a nerd, you know. I, I liked to do things like make up math problems that I would solve. I, I was also fairly athletic. Uh, as well. So, you know, nothing uh, stands out. I did have an uncle who um, was an electronics engineer, and he really got me started in the area of computer science, you know, very early. Uh, and I was, I think I was programming in Fortran in the early 60s. So that was, I think, a formative part of the, the sequence of events that, that led me to where I am today. You told me once that as a kid, you, one of the things you like to do is to make up problems and then solve them. Were they primarily around computers and mechanicals? When did your, what was your early schooling like? Because you were not, you did not go to college to become a doctor. No, um, I, as I said, was very interested in computer science and eventually bioengineering uh, aspects of computer science, but I went to MIT and my purpose there really was to uh, major in computer science. And that was in the early days uh, before you know, desktop computing, uh, PDP-11 was the, was the new rage then. Um, and um, ultimately was involved in uh, some postgraduate research project on my way to a PhD, which involved the computer analysis of, of human gait, walking analysis, um, using that to do some orthopedic uh, engineering to treat kids with cerebral palsy. And, you know, it was at that time that I saw uh, kind of physicians interacting directly with the patients and that really intrigued me because I like the idea of you know solving problems but then being able to apply it directly to the bedside. Mm -hmm. So you went to medical school but not in Illinois or East Coast, you came out here, why don't you come out to uh, UCSF? Yeah, I mean I grew up in the Chicago area, I had never been west of the Mississippi uh, prior to that and I don't know, several of my classmates at MIT had gone to UCSF. It was considered to be a very good school, mixing you know science and uh, uh, clinical training. And I picked up and arrived in San Francisco in 1976, and have been here most of the time since then. Now, your early interest in medicine were not in cardiovascular, and in fact, you told me that you specifically did not want to be a surgeon. What were you? What were you originally going to train in? Right, and, I, and I'm not a surgeon now. I just want to be uh, clear about that. Um, although. Sometimes I do believe that a chance to cut is a chance to cure. Uh, so um, my in medical school, I was actually very interested in, in neurology and psych psychiatry, actually. Um, and just because I, I liked the sort of complicated systems and to think about the way things worked. And uh, you know, ultimately, as I moved into electrophysiology, when I went into electrophysiology, it was considered the neurology uh, of cardiology because you would be able to make these obscure diagnoses but had nothing to do to treat them. Obviously that's changed both now in neurology and cardiology but that was um, my, my initial thrust. And again that, that connection goes back to identifying a problem and then trying to solve it. There were no therapies when you got into electrophysiology, only diagnostics. Yeah, I mean, in those days, uh, and this is, you know, I'd say pre-1988 or so, um, you know, electrophysiology was primarily uh, a diagnostic discipline that you had basically medications and then pacemakers as well. Um, and, you, you know, one of the things that struck me about that was you would be giving these systemic medications 
for a problem that was you know localized and it was that that got me thinking ultimately to uh, trying to design devices and treatments that were specific to specific problems in the heart. How did you get into electrophysiology per se? Was that accidental or half or did you look at all the various fields you could have gone into right. and thought that matched best what you were interested in? Yeah, I mean, electrophys actually I was quite interested in, even in medical school and I went to uh, University of uh, Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania, HUP, to train in cardiology and EP because that was really the top center in the world at that time, knowing that that was what I wanted to do. So. I kind of used cardiology training and to, as a vehicle to EP um, after internal medicine. So it was seven or eight years later. Uh, and again, the, the interesting thing about physiology is each patient is a sort of his own experimental laboratory. I don't want to sound glib, but each patient to try to sort out what their diagnosis is was a real challenge. It was a real sort of problem solving, uh, you know, mental exercise, and you know, really enjoyed that. And uh, you know, so that sort of had carried me through. In the early days, you were also applying your computer yes. skills to this whole field. Talk a little about the right. models that you did. Well, you know, what, you know, sort of an obvious thing, but if you want to treat something, um, often you need to know how it occurs. And the electrophysiologic system, the connection system of the heart is extraordinarily complicated, obviously, and you could never know through actual biological experimentation what every cell was doing but we could model that in the computer and so I had a sort of a whole career if you will of research uh, several grants NIH grants etc doing computer modeling of the heart and trying to understand the origin of arrhythmias and ultimately um, my interest uh, turned to the, the um, uh, to the, the role of anatomy specific defects in the anatomy which we can talk about but we were able to simulate a lot of those defects in the computer model so it was that that allowed us to, to at least test hypotheses about um, electrophysiologic mechanisms. Electrophysiology was a relatively new discipline at the time how was your work received were you off on a tangent on your own or was were you at the center of what else was going on in electrophysiology because eventually you came back here but as right. you were as you were working through what electrophysiology was about at that time right were you were you working within the mainstream of that relatively narrow field well it was a very narrow field i mean a lot of cardiology departments didn't even have electrophysiology and frankly didn't think they needed it um, and um, you know, I, I happened to get into the field at just the time that people were starting to think about catheter ablation. That was the the initial uh, interventional therapy um, in a relatively gross form. But uh, so I was fortunate enough to be at one of the centers at UCSF with Mel Scheinman that we were really pushing that. And uh, at that time, the energy source that was being used was direct current shock. I mean, 300 joules blowing up the heart, and there had been, and radio frequency had been used in neurosurgery uh, for a long time to, you know, uh, get rid of lesions on the spinal cord. And so it was sort of a combination of that technology, thinking about maybe using that in the heart, that we were able to develop radio frequency catheter ablation uh, to replace DC. And that's obviously exploded in its, uh, in its utility. You know, it's interesting because I, I know from talking to medical device executives that, you know, there's kind of pecking order for physician specialties and, you know, interventional cardiologists are wonderful because they're avid technology adopters and, and others like general surgeons actually tend to have a reputation not for being particularly uh, avid technology adopters. But EPs actually rank very high among product companies. As you were working in the early days of, of EP, was the main issue figuring out where to get the tools from or was the main issue figuring out what the science was and what was really going on in this whole field and really trying to understand right. what was going on? Well, you know, there was nothing to adopt. I mean, essentially, we were creating the field of interventional EP. Um, and one of my pet peeves is the whole thing called interventional cardiology is sort of missing the fact that, you know, that electrophysiology is highly interventional. Um, uh, we sort of get left out of that uh, that description, and s appropriately so because interventional EP was a small area. But we were searching around. I mean, the the first DC catheter ablations were diagnostic uh, uh, barred catheters hooked up to defibrillator units, and we would get 300 joules, the same energy that you would shock a patient, and use that. And the same thing with radio frequency. I mean, we were using these generator boxes from the OR, 
and hooking them up to catheters. And actually, it was a long time. It took a lot of effort to get the companies to start to make these things for them to realize that it was a big enough market, frankly, because EP was this little little area. And, uh, and that's why I think a lot of the innovation came from the doctors, even in terms of actually implementing that innovation. Mm -hmm. So you spent a couple, how long did you spend at University of Penn because then you came back out to here to be on the faculty of UCSF? Right. I was at uh, HUP for four years mm -hmm. and then uh, came back to San Francisco to be on the, the faculty at UCSF. Mm -hmm. And you met someone of uh, the faculty of UCSF, uh, Paul Yock. Talk about your meeting with Paul Yock and some of the early uh, interactions or influences sure. of, that work, of that meeting. Yeah, Paul has uh, clearly been one of the biggest influences uh, in some of my work and has been tremendously helpful in, in every one of the companies uh, that we've been able to launch. Um, as I say, uh, early on we started to become interested in cardiac anatomy because, you know, drugs are treating the whole thing and, you know, these problems we felt were localized. For example, accessory pathways in patients with Wolf Parkinson White turn out to be tiny little connections between the atrium and the ventricle. And um, we started to develop catheter ablation techniques, but we couldn't see where the catheters were. I mean, you could see them on fluoro, but the endocardial surface is, you know, you don't see that. So um, actually, my wife was doing some research with Paul using IBIS to look at arteries, and that was, you know, the, the old, early development days. And so we got the idea that maybe you could stick an IBIS catheter in in order to see where the ablation catheter was and even to guide the catheter ablation. And so sort of through that, I started collaborating with Paul. And Paul was actually instrumental in encouraging me to file some of my earliest patents, uh, which were in that area, the use of ultrasound diagnostic tools to guide ablation. Uh, he, Paul even was the first one to tell me to start a lab notebook to put those things in. And, and so um, he's been influential in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I, I want to get to, I want to talk a little about some of the other research you were doing at this time, but at what point, I mean, you mentioned that Paul had advised you to start a, a lab notebook and to file for some patents. At what point did you begin to think about this, not just as academic or clinical research, but as potentially leading to device creation, if not company creation? Right. Well, early on, I mean, as I said, we were putting these pieces together. Um, everything we did was off-label. I mean, I don't think we ever did anything on-label. Um, and uh, and so in the early days, it was just sort of driven by, you know, we wanted to treat this patient or this group of patients, you know, what do we need? Um, I began to work on scientific advisory boards and just a little, learned a little bit about how companies work, but really was incredibly naive. And some of that naivete led to a certain level of frustration, which I think ultimately led to starting companies, which was, you know, we had several inventions that basically either got licensed or never went anywhere um, because the larger companies just weren't interested in that. Um, you know, in hindsight, probably understandably so because they considered it to be a small market. Mm -hmm. But it was a little bit of the, think of the frustration trying to get these bigger companies to do what we wanted them to do and then the bigger companies sort of extracting from us uh, some of the ideas and um, that ultimately led to uh, the concept that smaller companies might be able to focus on that specific idea. And of course that's obviously a model for a lot of medical device entrepreneurs. Before we go into the company creation part of it though, talk about some of your early research because you were at that time among the, one of the first to explore the notion that there are anatomical correl correlatives for in electrophysiology. Right. What, what were you trying to investigate? What were you trying to drive at with that? Right. Work? I mean again there was this notion that for 50 years, um, I mean, since Hodgkin, Huxley, etc., that um, the only thing that was abnormal in a cardiac arrhythmia were what's called functional properties, the actual potential duration, the distribution of refractoriness, and all of the drugs, in fact, still most of the drugs we have today, quinidine, etc., they're developed and tested with the idea that they work on a cell physiology. And you have to be a little pessimistic because how are you going to be able to treat you know, every cell? So we started to get the idea that, there may, that these arrhythmias may be localized. And the Wolf Parkinson White example was the first one. And the surgeons have been operating on that for a long time. Interestingly, the surgeons would always claim that you know, it was this wide, the connection between the atrium and the ventricle. They needed to cut this much 
ultimately we were able to show that you can make a two millimeter lesion and, and ablate that. Um, so it was WPW that then led to, you know, well, gee, if WPW is anatomic, what about some of these other arrhythmias? And, you know, we kind of went down the list and all of them wound up being anatomically based. Now, again, how do you study that? Because you cannot see the cardiac anatomy other than the gross outline uh, in an in ablation procedure. You see the catheter bouncing around and you kind of see a blob. So in order to kind of develop that hypothesis, which hypothesis was going to be linked to therapy? I mean, I think at that point we were thinking, let's figure out what's going on, but, you know, let's figure out how to treat that once we figure it out. We began to use um, what we called ICE, intracardiac uh, uh, echo, to look at elements of the heart, uh, the crystal terminalis, the coronary sinus, a bunch of anatomic things, the pulmonary veins, which would ultimately become very important, and sort of map the cardiac arrhythmias and correlate where the arrhythmia is mapped to with the anatomy, and the echo was, was real important for that. And your early experience and early training in computer modeling, computer training, was instrumental in that because that's, that was the tool you used. Correct. In fact, it was an iterative process because, um, too technical, but the crystal terminalis is this anatomic uh, junction between two types of tissues, and it's, it's sort of a line of conduction. And we had a hypothesis that atrial flutter uh, critically dependent on that and so we went to the computer model and said well if we put in this this in condition can we get flutter and in fact we did get flutter in the model we predicted where um, ablation would be successful in, in severing this this loop this reentry loop and you know and it worked um, so it, again it, at that point I would say most of my career in clinical EP the research I was doing was trying to solve clinical problems that would lead to therapies not just theoretical solutions Right, and that, and that raises an interesting question because you were trying to drive to therapies in an area where they're only doing diagnostics, but what was the reception among cardiologists in general, folks who would eventually have to turn their patients over to you, about the fruitfulness of the research that you were doing? Uh, it, it sounds all terribly theoretical, right? Um, and they must have had other solutions when these patients came in. What, what, what was the response of the medical community to those kinds of concepts? Well, you know, there was an adoption curve for new clinical procedures like anything else, and I think it was a fairly long-tailed adoption curve. Um, and I think it's, uh, again, part of the problem is actually convincing general cardiologists and general internists that the problem even existed. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, unless you make an effort to diagnose these things, you don't see them. I mean, for example, atrial flutter, um, when we first started doing atrial flutter ablations, you know, the cardiologists say, you know, it's rare, we never see it. Now it's the most common ablation. And so I think some of it was just raising the consciousness that these things existed and then the consciousness that, um, that there was therapy. But I mean, EP for a long time, and I would have to say probably still in a lot of centers is, you know, you get the back room, you know, we'll, t we'll turn a closet, in, you know, into an, an EP lab for you, um, you know, and, um, you know, so it, it was a bit of a push, but I think once a given cardiologist would send a patient, and this patient maybe had arrhythmias every day, was going crazy, and the medicans, medications didn't work or drove the patient crazy, the patient would come back cured, you know, the cardiologist became a believer, and so you'd start to see more and more patients from that, uh, from that referring source. Mm -hmm. And you were one of the first EPs to pay attention to the atrium as a source. Talk, talk about that. Yeah, you know, again, um, the arrhythmias that sort of people first turned their attention to were so-called SVT, AV node reentry, WPW, and then ventricular tachycardia was big, um, uh, and, and that was ultimately really treated with devices, but the atrium was sort of this black hole and not many people, people thought it was too complicated to approach. And I think the use of echo helped us understand the anatomy, correlate the anatomy with the physiology, and then let us target uh, ablation lesions to specific arrhythmia substrates. And it's, it's by far the most common uh, uh, chamber for ablation today. So you mentioned before that your original goal was not to be an entrepreneur, but was simply to find someone else to work with you to develop these tools and you approach big companies. It wasn't just the smallness of the, or the tiny size of the market, however, that was daunting to big companies. You, you actually had several unpleasant experiences with, with large companies, again, because I think it's instructive to mm -hmm. folks who are doing that. What, what were some of your early experiences with big companies that led you to turn away and, and start your own company? Um, you know, I mean, one of the things that would happen is we would have an invention and 
uh, a company engineer would sort of appear as one of the inventors. And, you know, I thought, well, what the heck, there's five u university guys and one, you know, so there's one out of six is from the university. But that one uh, person from, from outside the university, I mean, as you know, um, every inventor has the right to practice that invention. So to get an exclusive license from the university is not possible unless you get the outside inventor to, uh, to assign his rights. So even to this day, that actually is a problem in some uh, potentially really important patents that, that I have that the University of California has assigned to them. Um, so I think, you know, that uh, I was naive about that. Um, and then just, you know, sort of the, you know, where was this invented kind of thing. Um, you know, physicians come cheap, basically, or at least they used to and still do. I mean, you sit a doc down uh, at dinner, give him a bottle of wine, and he'll tell you all you want to know about, you know, his problem and his solution. Uh, and, and so, um, uh, you know, that kind of naivete, I think, led to some important lessons. You mentioned before the important connection made between atrial fibrillation and pulm pulmonary vein. That led to your first company, Atrionics. Right. Talk about the uh, Atrionics and where it came from uh, and how the technology got started. Right. What right. you're trying to do with that technology. Yeah, I mean, H after all these other arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation was sort of the last thing out there, the kind of holy grail. And again, most, almost everybody in electrophysiology certainly in cardiology, thought that you would never be able to treat that with ablation. It was just a, a drug, uh, just drug therapy. And I don't know, it was a funny thing. I, um, people, Jim Cox had invented a surgical operation, basically carving the atrium up into this maze. And I mean, it's a terrible operation, um, rarely done just for AFib, now sometimes done in combination with uh, uh, other types of valve surgery, et cetera. Um, and so we started to try to explore the use of catheters to do that. And there was actually a, a really bright uh, electrophysiologist in France named uh, Michel Hassiger who was making linear lesions. And I remember at a meeting in France, he showed this slide of the arrhythmia that he had left over after the linear lesions. And I saw on that slide that there were these spikes coming from the pulmonary vein catheter. And I don't think that was recognized by people at the time. And, you know, I thought, well, geez, you know, I don't know where it's coming, but if we could block the exit of all impulses from that pulmonary vein, you know, couldn't we sort of finish it off? Um, and so that led to the idea of what's called circumferential pulmonary vein lesions, uh, which led to the um, uh, starting of atrionics. Uh, and that technology. But talk about the actual company creation itself because you remained on the faculty at UCSF and in fact you didn't really, am I right in thinking you actually never worked at Atrion, the company certainly was run by Michael Michael Ross. Mm -hmm. um, was it your intention, was it your goal simply to turn that over to someone else as you would have with a big company relationship or what was your thinking at, at well, founding Atrion? You know, I mean, a lot of these things are just the result of fortuitous events. Uh, I'd like to say that innovation is this planned process and we're all trying to learn that it is and I think mostly it is, but there are also these things that happen. and. I was really busy on a clinical service and just doing all kinds of ablations and we had a really busy service and um, Michael Ross who was a neuroradiologist at Stanford and was kind of trying to become an entrepreneur came to me to do some due diligence on an idea which was a terrible idea, uh, not terrible but it wasn't a commercially viable idea and I said you know, you know, I was about to go do a case, I said you know you can cure atrial fibrillation and he said you know what are you talking about and I sort of took out this stack of yellow, you know, papers with all of my drawings on. I said, you can cure atrial fibrillation. And so he kind of went away and tried to figure out what, what kind of problem that was and came back. And we then kind of went through the process of, you know, what do you have here and what can we do about that? Um, and so in no, by no means was I intending to start a company. In fact, frankly, I was too busy to even do much with it. Uh, because I say ablation had really taken off and we were really, you know, 14, 16 hour days of these procedures. Uh, so I really didn't have the time to do that and Michael coming on board and kind of moving this process forward I think was really key to getting that first thing going. 
And yet at some point, the, the bug hit you that you wanted to play more of an active sure. role in the management because you, you mentioned to me that even though you were on the board, you, you said to me that Atriana's quickly got away from me. Uh, talk about what you mean by that, and and, and then I'll, we'll go into the yeah, second question. Yeah, I mean, question. you know, Atrion, it's has been successful. It was acquired by Johnson Johnson. Um, you know, I think the technology development is still slower than uh, everyone would have liked. Uh, and I, I think what happened early on is that, you know, and I think this is a very common thing, you know, I as the inventor and as the physician that understood the electrophysiology, you know, kind of wanted to or expected to to be more involved in the actual development. I was on the board of directors, um, you know, but frankly, in an early stage company like that, you know, the board doesn't have that much influence. Um, and I was science advisor, advisor, but it depends on whether they asked me for my, my advice or not. So I got to see a lot of the inside of what went on in a company in terms of, you know, financing and operations and manufacturing and, you know, R&D and all those elements, clinical regulatory. Um, but I got a little frustrated at that, you know, I kind of wasn't running it because I, I thought it, I could have run it better. Probably I wouldn't have, but nonetheless, that was my thinking at the time. Who were the early investors in Atrionics? Who were the early, early investors? Uh, Brentwood was, was uh, one of the early investors. Mm -hmm. And did you play any role in, in helping to raise that initial money? Oh, or did you... Absolutely. I mean, I, some of the investors are probably here and they could dispute this, but I think, uh, uh, you know, I think when a physician comes with an idea and he's passionate about it and he really believes it and, you know, it's not bullshit, um, I think you know, passion is a really big part of, of innovation and the fact that I believe in this and could explain it pretty well um, and I think being able to tell a good story is important at, at it, no matter what you do. Uh, and so, yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't think Michael could have raised it on his own um, if I hadn't been there. But, he, you know, he was uh, term sheets and all that kind of stuff Michael was very good at. Were you aware, I don't know if you experienced it because you had no point of, of reference, a lot of the serial entrepreneurs that we've spoken with here, and obviously Adrian was your first go, uh, have had you know ups and downs raising money. But certainly, going to raise money in 1997 in the medical device community could hardly have been a worse time. You had public investors furious over the failures of some small companies that had gone public a couple of years earlier. You had a lot of the VC firms turning away from medical device investing to look at IT and dot coms. What was it like raising money in 97? Did you realize that you had walked into one of the worst financing environments? I, you know, in my career, I've never heard someone say it's a good financing envi environment. So, uh, you know, certainly uh, the entrepreneurs will, will say that. Um, I don't know. You know, uh, it's, it's, uh, I've been very blessed, very lucky. I've never had a really rough go at financing. I think some of the exits have been a little rougher. Um, but certainly getting money, I don't know, I, I think, you know, what I've been told by the venture capitalists, at least today, and I think it was true then, is that there's a lot of money out there. I mean, when there's this much wealth creation in the stock market, you know, people have 5% of their portfolio or whatever in, in venture, and they have to spend the money. But, so the good ideas will get the money, mm -hmm. and the bad ideas don't. And I think we were able to tell a good enough story that we had a good idea for a big market uh, and you know, an unsolved uh, you know, problems that hadn't been uh, approached before. And, I, and we were able to raise money pretty well. So your next company was Apriva. And talk right. a little about what the technology was, what the device was that Apriva was right. founded to, to create. Right, right. Again, this uh, goes back to this issue of atrial fibrillation and um, the idea that cardiac anatomy is important. And, you know, with curing ablation, you put the patient back in sinus rhythm and they don't have to take medications anymore. But, uh, frankly, the vast majority of patients are sort of okay with their atrial fibrillation in terms of symptoms. What they don't like is the risk of stroke. I mean, it's sort of every day they are alive or they fib, they're worried about having a stroke. And so for that, there's a blood thinner known as Coumadin, or warfarin. And the problem with warfarin is it prevents blood clots, but in exchange for that, it causes bleeding. And because of that, there's a requirement for a lot of monitoring of the therapy, blood tests once a month, um, and about two-thirds of the patients that are supposed to be on it aren't on it. So we thought, well, you know, there's, there's a market, there's an opportunity, and it, it's sort of one of those problems that 
most, probably all cardiologists at that time thought, it's a pain in the ass, but you know, it's just the way it is. That's, you know, not everything is easy in life. And giving Coumadin and monitoring Coumadin is just, you know, one of the things we do. Um, but somehow I was at a, a cardiology at a, at a meeting and I heard something from a CT surgeon about cutting the appendage off. And it turns out that the surgeons, when they went in to do operations on, say, mitral valve, I mean, since the 30s, have been cutting the appendage off and sewing it shut. Why? To prevent stroke, because everyone knows the clots come from the appendage, and that's widely accepted. Um, and it's interesting because the surgeons took it for gr so much for granted they wouldn't even put it in their operative report. I mean, it's just they cut the appendage off, um, which makes it frustrating to go back and try to do research on that group of patients. But um, so, so I thought, well, if we could block the appendage without doing surgery, you know, that might be a good thing to do. And so we came up with the idea of um, an expandable element that would be put in through a catheter. It would go into the appendage, open it, and shut the uh, shut the door. Um, and so that was the idea. Uh, I was um, fortunate to run into an engineer, Eric Vandenberg, uh, and helped me found that company, and, and we got things going. This was when, 1998? I think it was 98 that we started at Priba? Mm -hmm. Correct. Now, one thing that's interesting about your work is it's all so recent, it's hard to, to make definitive judgments about the outcome, but you made an interesting point, which was that you were somewhat going against the ex conventional wisdom or the accepted way of doing things in the space. When you began to talk to clinicians about, you, about a therapy that would not include Coumadin, what was the general response? Well, like all these months of technologies, people said you're crazy. I mean, they would say you're crazy on several levels. You know, um, I think that the first level of you're crazy was a technical one. I mean, every every doctor thinks they're an engineer, and if they can't think of the solution, then they don't think it's possible to do. And it's actually very interesting because trying to do even clinical due diligence was hard early on because you couldn't get people to say, you know, if I would say. Pretend there is this device that can include the appendage. Pretend that it, you could do it and it's safe. Do you think that would be helpful? And the typical response was, well, you're going to have leaks and it's going to perforate and you're going to get clots. And I mean, it was hard for people to get past the technical issues to even assess whether this was going to be a good medical therapy. Um, so, um, you know, we were fortunate in having some, some good investors uh, in Versant who were able to, to kind of see past that and some great engineers who were able to develop that. So you face a situation that some entrepreneurs do, which is that while your first company is still up and going, and in fact at a relatively early stage, you come up with an idea right. for another company. Right. Why didn't you just create that technology within Atrionics, and, and, and how did you come to the decision to form a different company? I understood an important word called dilution. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, through several financings, uh, came to really understand and um, you know the dilution is the worst word in the English language and liquidity is the best um, so first of all I should say uh, because there's a university aspect to this too that Atrion the Atrionics technology was developed while I was at UCSF and therefore UCSF had a license to that and uh, had an um, assignment and they licensed it uh, out to Atrionics and that was in itself a real hassle. Um, I mean, the, the founding of Atrionics consisted of me writing a check to my own university for $10,000 to license my own technology out of UCSF in order to start a company. So with the Priva, I started it outside the university. I mean, none of the work that I did was done at the university at all. Um, so, you know, there was that element of it. We didn't have the, the overhead, the burden of the university. Um, and um, uh, out of um, you know, sort of an abundance of caution, I offered the Apriva technology to the Atrionics board, um, and they, you know, they clearly weren't going to be able to develop. And in a good early stage company, you know, focus, focus, focus. You can only make one thing, um, and so that's that was you know the main issue. The, the, the dilution thing is, you know, if you've already funded a company. And you let's say the common, you know, the founders, whatever, own now a third of the company. Any financing for that new company will now already be diluted by two thirds, and then you dilute farther down. So, by going into a new company, you start out owning owning 100% of that new technology, and obviously then suffer the dilution of the financing. But that's 
you know, but, but that's that was part of the reason, just the, the financial aspects of it, and and the idea that you could focus on that product being developed uh, without it getting lost and mingled with another technology. And you look back on it, how much was it also a matter that having gone through the experience, the early experience with Atriotics, you really just wanted to test your own capabilities in founding and, and running a, and actually running a company. Absolutely. I mean, that was another big part of the motivation was I wanted to go start this thing from scratch. Um, though even the running of it, you know, I sort of on the fence about that. I mean, uh, Becky Robinson, who was our, uh, our venture capitalist, will remember that, you know, for the first six months or so, I was still at the university, kind of went half time. Um, but we, we needed a new this story that I tell, true story, is that we needed a new okay. fax machine. For our, we had this office where you know patient referrals would come in, and we had this big fax machine, and we needed a new one. And so we began the process of requisitioning and capital budget cycles and committees and meetings. And around the same time I put that request in, we I met Eric. We wrote a business plan. We raised 3.6 million. I think we had 5,000 square feet. We'd done an animal study. We had a couple engineers, and I still didn't have the fax machine. So I said, you know, God is talking to me here. And um, it was at that point that I decided to go uh, run um, run a Priva. And as I say, we we're very fortunate to have good people early on that really knew how to, you know, the operational aspects uh, of running a company, which helped me a lot. I think at the the broader strategic level of leadership. There are a couple of things that are common to all small companies, and you now you were working on your second company and first most directly um, in within two years but talk about the challenges of hiring the right people finding a scientific advisory board uh, just to begin with where did you get your investors with the same folks who had invested in atrionics did you go somewhere else um I think about this yeah well um, first of all the people because clearly I think if I have one skill it's it's in picking good people um, I think that's absolutely the key uh, Mike Colbert, who's here, was our uh, headed up our clinical regulatory and just did an incredible job getting stuff through. I mean, we did we got a CE mark with 22 patients with an invasive device in the left atrium. Uh, so I think good people, and I don't know uh, for some reason I have uh, I've just been lucky or I have a knack for picking good people. Um, I tend to do things on, very much on instinct and kind of make quick decisions, and it's, it's been lucky so far. Uh, so getting good people is, I think, really important. In terms of the investors, yes, uh, Brantwood was an investor in Atrionics, and that yeah, that fund morphed into Versant, and they were investors actually in both uh, uh, Apriva and ultimately Microlife. So Microlife was your third company. Correct. When did you found that, and what was what is the technology behind Microlife? Uh, when did I found that? I think 99, I believe. Um, well, this is a whole other area. I mean, the, the two sort of holy grails, other than coronary disease of cardiology, are atrial fibrillation and congestive heart failure. And um, just, you know, through my clinical practice and being around, uh, it was known that mitral valve regurgitation was a huge problem in patients with heart failure. The heart dilates. Once it dilates, the mitral valve dilates. Blood starts going retrograde, you have volume overload, and then that cycle just contends to continue itself. And um, there were some surgeons uh, who were doing an operation to put a ring around the mitral valve, open heart surgery. Now, these, taking these patients to the operating room, you know, in some hands there was a 15 or 20 percent mortality rate just from going to the operating room. So we thought, you know, maybe there's an easier way. And this sort of, again, the use of anatomy and the use of things that are done every day in one field that become innovations in, a, in another. One of the things that we do in EP is we put catheters in the coronary sinus. And the reason we do that is to map the atrioventricular ring around the mitral valve because we can record the electrical systems. So you have a catheter in the coronary sinus. It sits in constant relationship to the mitral annulus. And we had tip deflectable catheters. So lo and behold, you could squeeze the catheter and guess what? You know, we put an echo in there, mitral regurgitation got better and went away. So that led to the idea that you could develop um, a, uh, you know, a catheter that would go into the coronary sinus through the vein, through, not even through an arterial axis, but through a venous axis, into the right atrium, into the coronary sinus, squeeze, and then unhook and let the thing sit there. And so that's the, the mitral life technology. It's, um, it's a percutaneous 
mitral annuloplasty. And when you found him, I thought, were you the CEO of a preva at that time? Yeah, I, I, you know, got pretty busy for a while, um, like as in three years. Uh, and in fact, started MitraLife, founded it, and became the CEO, chairman of that, while I was also running a Priva, in fact, doing the financing. So it was there were some busy days. Now, truth be told, you got into a little bit of a fight with your investors on MitraLife, um, and maybe we should back up before we get to that and talk about how you made the connection with EV3, because EV3 eventually acquired both uh, a Priva and MitraLife. How yeah. did you make? How did you meet? Dale Spencer, Paul Buckman, the folks at, at yeah. I mean, the first person I met was Paul, Paul Buckman, and I think we were up at an interventional meeting up in uh, in Seattle um, for a Priva, and I think EV3 was just in the process of being formed. And this guy came up to me, and you know, he looked like a, some kind of a sales guy, um, and he kind of hands you. I talked to you, hands me his car, and it's like a chintzy little car. I don't know who this guy is. And, you know, so a couple weeks later, he sends me an email and get together with me. Okay, fine. Um, but ultimately, he persisted, you know, thank goodness. And we got to talking about um, uh, uh, Mitral Life and then later on about Apriva. I mean, EV3 has a very interesting philosophy, which is to try to find underserved markets in cardiology that are still big markets mm -hmm. and and have innovative innovative solutions it's not the next balloon angioplasty the next stent but rather uh, um, you know treatment for heart failure using a transcatheter device those kind of things are what they were looking for to roll up and so ultimately um, uh, they acquired um, uh, mitral life after you know a process now, I want to get to that for a second, but, you know, uh, Dale Spencer, who's the chairman, and Paul Buckman, who's the mm -hmm. CEO, are, were former SIMED folks, and they were, they were backed by uh, Warburg Pincus and right. the Virgil. Did you know that's not a two-bit, you know, heritage in... I in, heard of them. You heard of them. Actually... Did you know that? Did you... Were you aware of I mean, of to be completely frank with you, I didn't know who Dale was. In fact, I didn't know Paul, because remember, I'm on the EP side. Yeah. So we knew EPT. You know, we knew those people, um, but I didn't really know the SIMED people. I didn't know their heritage, um, and uh, you know, which is obviously huge. I actually knew best because they had funded EP Technologies 12 years before that. In fact, Bess Weatherman. Weatherman from Warburg. In fact, she was kind enough to dig up her um, due diligence memorandum mm -hmm. for EPT. Um, you know, that she had written up. 12 years ago when they were investing. It was kind of funny. Uh, so you sold so, Mitral Life, which was your third company, before mm -hmm. you sold your second, but both went to EV3. Correct. Talk about that, the process, why you sold uh, Mitral Life, because it was not, uh, as I understand it, uh, universally applauded by your investors. They were a little upset that you made that move. Well, I mean, we... Um, we had had initially raised, I think, uh, how much did we raise? Eight million, I believe. Um, essentially, the, the common shareholders still. No, it wasn't eight million. I'm sorry. It was two million. Uh, and uh, the pre-money valuation was such that the common shareholders still owned a majority of the board. And we had had um, an acquisition discussion with a company called Yomed for forty million dollars. And you know, if you do the math, that's a pretty good step up. Yeah. But since the common owned most of the stock. The common would benefit most, and the VCs would, you know, get a very small return, uh, big, big X, but small actual dollar amount. So there was a, a lot of discussion over whether to sell then or do some additional financing and build value, you know. But y you have to get down on these spreadsheets and look at the risk uh, and, you know, the upside. And, you know, there was a little bit of a battle on the board. The common shareholders thinking that selling now would be good both in terms of technology development because we needed more money and in terms of the you know the return on the time that had been put in and, and the capital that had put into into that time one thing that was curious is that I mean a lot of uh, entrepreneurs particularly physician entrepreneurs you know have a vision of what the technology can do and like to ride that out you flipped to the exit strategies atrium sold you said to mm -hmm. to J&J &J before the technology was actually developed was there not an instinct on your part to say, you know what? I mean, m most th most uh, investors run into the opposite problem. Guys who want to hold up too late, miss right. that window 
of opportunity. Well, you know, on none of these was I ever thinking about flipping it. I mean, we were in business to develop a technology and bring it to market. And we were financing to do that. We were budgeting to do that. And frankly, I think the way you sell a company is you plan on not selling it. You know, it's like looking at a, at a dim star. You see it best when you look away from it. Um, because if you're planning on going to market, th there's already a horse race between keeping the company and selling it much less between two potential uh, acquirers. So, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, it would have been fun to keep it, but I have uh, people working in the company, um, you know, who can do well with, uh, with, with a, an acquisition, investors, et cetera. So I think it comes down to business. You know, at that point, you need to, re you need to remove your own ego out of, the, out of the thing and say, what's the right business decision? Um, and given, you know, valuations that we got, and the dilution that would have been suffered with additional um, uh, financings and the risk that things wouldn't work out going forward. You know, it was just it was just smart business. Mm -hmm. You did three deals in rapid succession. Uh, Metrolife was founded when? About 2000? Uh, 99, I think. 99? Yeah. Um, and then almost as quickly stopped. Did you run out of the passion to run companies? Did you run out of ideas for, for medical device technology? I still have an incredible amount of passion to run uh, the companies I sold probably and and uh, <laughs> we'll get into that but um, I mean you know every entrepreneur thinks that once they sell that the acquirer doesn't know what they're doing and you know it takes them a year to find out where the bathroom is and blah 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 and you know it, it's certainly true that larger companies are not entrepreneurial so the things that you would do, things that I would do, uh, that would have a you know, just essentially higher risk, higher benefit profile, wouldn't be done. Um, so, I mean, I didn't, I don't know if I ran out of ideas or not. I mean, I never tried to have any ideas, and I never really thought my goal was to go out there and start companies. I mean, even after Atrionics, I never sort of thought I would start another one until the idea came to me for a technology that would prevent stroke. And then I said, this should be a company. Mm -hmm. So where do you go from here? Because your next venture, as I understand it, isn't medical, it's in, it's in movies. Well, <laughs> I've actually started a uh, film production company uh, and plan on making films, um, independent uh, films, narrative and documentary. And, you know, this may be the first and last time I ever mention this in public because I don't know if this will go anywhere. <laughs> But um, I, I don't know, I've always been very visually oriented, my slide presentations, and I think thinking about, you know, devices is, is sort of, you, you think of them visually. Um, and um, I've always been interested in, in movies. I made movies since I was 10 years old. So I've had this opportunity. And frankly, making an independent movie, not Hollywood, but it's very much like being the CEO of a startup. I mean, you bring together talent, which is, you know, good engineers or good camera people and good editing people and good actors. You bring together ideas, which is IP on one side or scripts on the other, and you put the money together. And so there's a lot about this that feels similar to, to startup. And so right now I'm in the, you know, the, um, the deal flow mode. I'm looking at a lot of things, and we have a few projects that we're, we're, we've started. I'm also working on a screenplay of my own, which uh, has been... Uh, really fun fun challenging process mm -hmm. as you look back on it do you then look at the company creation that you did as a kind of episode in your life one which you now have you know earned uh, the ability to go on to do other things or do you think back and say gee no I may get back into that someday um, you know get me up here in a year I mean right now I don't think I would go back into medical devices I, I think that um, I don't know people say you know do you do you miss medicine do you miss medical devices and you know, I love my life. I like what I'm doing today. And so it's hard to miss something if you like what you're doing today. I have two kids, uh, almost six and two, and I love hanging out with them. Um, you know, I mean, I think, I don't know, 15 years ago, I said my goal is that by the time I'm 50, I want to be walking my, my kid to kindergarten. And, and I am, you know, although it's carpool. There's no, no nobody walks anymore. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, it's it's kind of like you get philosophical but sort of what's it all for I mean why do you work this hard and and um, I don't necessarily think you work this hard to then continue to work this hard mm -hmm. um, maybe that may be heresy but uh, that's my own my own belief well it's certainly been an interesting trajectory for a career and I don't mean to imply that it's over by any means but beginning in computer sciences and then moving on to really a distinguished academic career then a stint as a medical device entrepreneur now on to 
on to movies. Well, good luck with what you do next. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks, Michael. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Bill Barron, and uh, I've had the uh, occasion to help a number of startups uh, bring in uh, government funding for their seed money, SBIR funding, uh, quite successfully. Uh, and I couldn't help but take note that you mentioned that you only raised uh, two million for Mitral Life before you sold it for about a 20 times uh, multiplier. If you'd used government funding, you could have sold that for about a 200 times multiplier. And I was just wondering whether or not you'd considered that uh, route. You know, we've considered um, the government stuff. It takes too long. At least in our assessment, it just was going to take too long. Um, again, I, you obviously know a lot more about it than I do, and I'm probably, you know, completely off base. My feeling was that you could get SBRs or S, uh, technology, you could get those. Um, it would make more sense for sort of, an, you know, a derivative technology that you didn't need to go as quickly on. Uh, and the other thing is that we really didn't, we didn't want to have any university connection, frankly. I think the overhead involved with having a university connection, at least in my experience, at least with UCSF, was too great to, you know, even consider. But, you know, even writing the grant, I mean, we were halfway through the development process before we would have had the grant written. So, uh, again, I know some people have been successful with that, but it just wasn't something that we cho cho choose to do, chose to do. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, Bill Overall, I'm with the Biodesign Innovation Program. Um, you've talked about three companies that, that were obviously very successful and uh, you got in and out very quickly or, or relatively quickly with those. Are there, are there other examples of things that you thought about doing that um, either never made it to the company stage or, or you know, it, I, I'm very impressed with how, how successful you've been with, with your three opportunities here. Well, clearly this would be public disclosure, so I'm obviously not going to talk about any other good ideas that I may have had or that may or may not be in my lab notebook. Um, first of all, I just you know I wanted to dispel a notion. I mean, it's sort of I never thought that I kind of flipped these. I, I don't know. It just hasn't. It wasn't in what we were trying to do. I guess I take a little bit of an umbrage in that because we really, you know, I really think to be successful in this stuff, if you start thinking about flipping, you will never make it. I mean maybe with a simple 510k device, but never with a PMA device. So, you know, we were lucky. We happened to be in the right place at the right time. We made some good business decisions, but our goal was not to flip. In terms of other ideas, you know, I mean, I have all kinds of ideas all the time. Um, well, we didn't mention it, but don't you hold a patent on one of the early, what would be an early Well, that's therapy? an interesting, yeah, in fact, um, it's very interesting. We have a 1993 patent, which teaches the injection it's a it's a it's a catheter with a needle at the tip that can inject into the myocardium and one of the things we teach are dna cells you know etc basically cell therapy and that to, to our knowledge is the earliest teaching of that um of you know basically uh gene therapy directly applied to the heart and so that patent is sort of out there it's one of the patents i talked about that has some ownership outside of the university but uh, you know so, so there's that I mean uh, you know I think if I was good I mean if I was going to invent something else what I would start to do is I would start to go to the GYN national meetings plastic surgery class you know ortho I would start going and trying to immerse myself in other areas to kind of try to spark some creativity but um, you know I, I, I just uh, you know the there's tons of things I would have liked to pursue, and then none of them, if that makes any sense. Thanks. My name is Alex with the uh, Biodesign Program. I had a question uh, regarding your decision to take on the CEO's role at uh, one of your companies in particular, and uh, whether it's obvious that you have a passion for product design, product development, for thinking through the solution uh, from the engineering and medical side. When you take on a role like that, how do you make sure you extract yourself from the passion to the degree necessary to allocate the time necessary to maybe the financing and the other role that are demanded of the CEO. Hire people that share your passion. It's just that simple. I mean, passion can be spread throughout the organization. And, um, you know, I happen to think I'm pretty good on the business side, but, um, you know, the leadership comes, I think, in continuing to have that passion spread through the organization. and. You know, and basically you hire good people, really good people, and you let them do their jobs. 
And you know, if you can't do that, you probably won't be successful because you can't do it all yourself. Let me ask you one final question, and that is that your initial, your early experience with large companies were not particularly pleasant experiences. Um, and then eventually you sold to Atrionics, to J&J, &J and EV3, I think is too new to qualify as a large company. But did your view of large companies change as you went deeper into company creation? I mean, you could argue in some respects they play a, a vital role, but did you, did you find that as you now had a more mature company and a more, you know, substantial entity that you deal with that the, some of the stuff that you were objection to went away or do you still? Well, you know, I think if you look at it from a macroeconomic scale, you know, you need big companies. I mean, basically small companies are high risk um, places that can do innovation and the big companies are low risk that can commercialize that. I mean, that's sort of the standard teaching. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I think it's, it's too early. Uh, the technologies being in J&J in &J and being in EV3, um, it's a little bit too early to, to say how I truly feel about it. Um, and we'll just have to see. We'll see, have to see how, how things develop. Great. Oh, Becky? That was you politic. <laughs> I have just one question, Michael. You have been very successful in three companies, and you certainly are well networked into the, into the community around here and have provide advice and counsel and to a lot of other entrepreneurs and if you were to kind of look back without being humble at why you've been successful and offer one piece of advice to folks getting started what do you think differentiates the difference between a company that does well both with the clinical and the medical side of it but financially and, and those that don't you know I think it's passion is one and just the total unwillingness to accept failure I mean you you know if your only endpoint is success you will always succeed and I just think you have to be, you know, there's two human emotions, you know, fear and desire. And if, you're, if, you, if you let fear into it, then you won't be successful. So it's all about just leaving your fear behind and going forward. I also think there's just a lot of intuition and some luck. You know, you have a sense for what the right way to go is, and you follow that sense, um, not worrying about the criticism along the way. And, and I, I think that's kind of fuzzy, but I, I sort of think that's the key. A lot of the serial entrepreneurs that we talk to, tell stories of failures, of things that went wrong and, and didn't. I think one of the things that impresses people is that maybe because you came to it relatively late in your academic career, your three companies were successful right in a row. And it doesn't sound like there were earlier efforts of starting companies trying to do things that, that didn't work out, but it's that it's that sense that, you know, there there were relatively few bumps along the road to not not that not that there aren't bumps in company creation itself and launching a trionic supreme right, right. mitral life but you know everybody tells stories about I had this great technology and I wrote it for a while and just crashed or right. I did something really crazy and it just never worked out. Well I mean I think one thing I didn't mention to Becky which is that you know disruptive technology you have to have to really be successful it's got to be something that's going to change the way medicine is practiced and all three of those things fortunately were like that and I I've had lots of ideas that are sort of incremental improvements wouldn't it be great if you had this because you could do this a little better um, so I think that's part of it you know I mean I wish I could I wish there was a formula but it's just uh, you know being with good people having really good ideas you know being able to get the investment being it's about telling stories and I really think that if you can tell a good story if you really believe in what you have and you can tell a good story, you can get good people who can make it happen, you can get financing, um, you know, and ultimately you can convince, you can sell, if you will, tell a good story to people who will take it to the next step. Great. Okay, any other questions? If not, Mike, thank you very much, and we'll uh, just drink some stuff in the back. Thank you. Thank you.